In this video, we're going to look at this theorem that we discussed in the last video and actually prove it. That is, given a group G and an element little g in our group, the smallest subgroup containing it is given by this set. So here's our theorem. So remember what this is claiming, that the smallest subgroup That's the definition of that angle brackets G. It's the smallest subgroup of H in G, capital G, that has little g as an element. And so what we want to prove is that the set on the right-hand side is, in fact, the smallest such subgroup. So I already claim, and we'll, I'll have a proof that's optional much in a much later video, that the smallest subgroup exists. That, in other words, there is in fact a group that contains little g. And there's a smallest such group. And so what do we need to claim? We need to claim that this set is a subset of that group and that this set is a group. So that's what we need to claim. Let's call this set on the right-hand side, right-hand side, right now. So we need to show that the right-hand side is a subgroup. And we're actually going to do that second, but first we're going to prove that the right-hand side is contained in the smallest subgroup containing the element G. Because it's a subset of the smallest subgroup of G, and it is a subgroup in its own right, well, that would mean that it must be the smallest subgroup, logically. by definition of smallest because being the smallest being a subgroup with g as an element means that angle brackets g has to be a subset of that set on the right hand side so let's do the first part first so since angle brackets g is a subgroup of g it is a group let's take advantage of that fact we want to show the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side, so let's let x be an element in the right-hand side. Well, then what can we conclude? That x is of the form g to the n for some n in z. Well, since g is an element of this cyclic subgroup generated by g, and n is an integer, we must have that g to the n is in the same group. Why? Because we had a video on exponentiation, which stated that whenever you had a group, you could define exponentiation for every element of the group where n was any integer, and the result was an element in your group. So by definition of exponentiation, g to the n is in your group. So we do have what we wanted. x is in the subgroup generated by g. So the set on the right-hand side is a subset of the set on the left-hand side. All right, now we show that x, which is defined to be this set on the right-hand side, is a subgroup of g. So for the sake of notation, I'm going to introduce x. So my postdoc mentor is fond of using this equal sign with a colon to indicate that I'm defining this symbol right now to be this set. That way I can start talking about elements of x and I don't have to keep writing 
this set over and over, which gets kind of complica complicated and hard to read. Now, for the sake of the video, I've chosen to replace the argument we just had with dot dot dot. The point is that this is being added on to what we just had. So let's use the subgroup criterion. Let A and B be elements of X. We need to show that A times B is an X and that A inverse is an X. So then what do we know? We know that A is equal to G to the N and B is equal to G to the M for some integers N and M. But then what's a times b? g to the n times g to the m. By properties of exponents, that's g to the n plus m. Well, that's an x. So we have closure under multiplication. Also, a inverse, that's g to the n to the negative 1 that's g to the negative n by properties of exponents, which is also an x. Why? Because in both cases, our exponent is an integer. So it's g to an integer power. Therefore, it's in our set of g to integer powers. Hence, x is a subgroup of g. And little g is an element of x. Well, by definition of smallest subgroup, we must have that the square cyclic group set generated by g must be a subset of x. Why? Because we had a subgroup containing little g, so the smallest subgroup containing little g must be a subset of our subgroup. And so we have both inclusions, therefore we have our theorem. As an indicator of how beautiful this result is if I worked with a set of with two elements instead it is not the case that you just be looking a to the n b to the m in general so this result is very very nice and only works with one element the reason why this doesn't work in general is because this is assuming commutativity. So for arbitrary subsets, the there isn't such a nice description of the set, only for cyclic subgroups. Piggybacking on the previous theorem, I'll include the proof in this video because it actually fits nicely with the previous result and also uses properties of exponents. Every cyclic group is abelian. So let G be an element of a larger group G. What do we want to show? We want to show the cyclic subgroup generated by G is abelian, which means that multiplication is commutative. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to take two arbitrary elements in G, in the cyclic subgroup generated by G, and we want to show that X times Y is equal to Y times X. Hence, G is abelian, the cyclic subgroup generated by G, that is. That's our hope. Well, let's figure out why that is. Well, X must be a power of G, and Y must be a power of G. For some integers N and M. because they're elements in the cyclic subgroup. 
So then let's do the calculation, g to the n, g to the m. That's just substitution. Working backwards from the finish line, y is g to the m, x is g to the n. What is the relationship between these two things? Well, properties of exponents says that the exponents add. And oh yeah, addition of integers is commutative. So we see that the exponents are actually the same here. And so we actually are able to connect the dots. So x times y is equal to y times x. And therefore, all cyclic groups are abelian. So I finished by pointing off the natural question. Is every abelian group cyclic? This is a natural question you always ask when you're learning something is, is the converse of result also true? We just proved that every cyclic subgroup must be abelian. Suppose your group is generated is a cyclic subgroup. I mean, suppose your group is abelian. Is it the case that it must be a cyclic subgroup? And the answer is no. And the simplest counterexample is the symmetry group of a rectangle. So E is the identity symmetry. H is the horizontal reflection flip, V is a vertical flip, and R is the 180 degree rotation. Here's the multiplication table. As we've discussed in class before, it is an abelian group because the Cayley table is symmetric. And the ith row, jth column is the same entry as the jth row, ith column. But if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by the identity element, you get just the identity element. This is always true. And if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by either of the flips, you're going to get the identity in the flip. And same with the rotation. You're only going to get the identity in the rotation. Why? Because each of these elements is its own inverse. So there's nothing else in that subgroup. And so each of these cyclic, cyclic subgroups is smaller than the, lar the whole group. And so you can't get the whole group to be of the form angle brackets g for any g. And so, no, it's not the case that every abelian group is cyclic because there's at least one counterexample.